Battle Line podcast. Uh, I know that there's new people who check out the show every week. So uh, for those new people coming on board, my name is Ian Tato. I am Chris Parato, also known as Tonto in some circles. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying your post-Super uh, Bowl week. I, I, we're recording this before the Super Bowl. So uh, if I were to make any predictions, it'd be stupid because you guys will know what happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Super Bowl, it's like a national holiday. So uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed we got plenty of great stuff to get to this episode. We have Holly McKay for her second appearance, author of Only Cry for the Living, ambassador for Burnt Children Relief. You've seen her on Fox News, various other places. Um, she's great. You've also seen her on Jocko's podcast, Mike Ritland's podcast. Um, and then we, prior to that, we actually have some pretty big news to get to. That's going to be in our first segment. Um, but before we get to any of that, you've heard us talk about Ned and uh, for you guys listening who, who haven't been checking out Ned, you got to ask yourself, what are you doing to keep your body strong during these times where immunity is paramount? And really the research being done about immunity and cannabinoids is, is really just great to see. The first person I saw it from was Chris Dykos, who was on the yep. show. But there's more and more coming out about how cannabinoids are helping your body with immunity. Now, Ned, unlike other brands, is USDA certified organic extracted from USDA certified organic hemp plants in Peonia, Colorado. And these products are science-backed nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. They also have their Distress Blend, which is an amazing new product. It's a 1-1 formula of CBD and CBG made from the world's purest full-spectrum hemp, also USDA certified organic. Full transparency, Ned shares third-party lab reports who farms their products and their extraction process all right there on their site. Ned's CBD products have over 2,000 five-star reviews, and they work with incredible partners within the medical field like Dr. Caroline Leaf, Dr. Christian Gonzalez, and Dr. Will Cole. And we're going to have the founders on in a couple of months, Rhett and Adrian. So if you guys have any questions about CBD, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. So you can shoot those over to us, uh, battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to give Ned a try, Battleline listeners get 15% off Ned products with the code Battleline. Visit helloned.com slash Battleline to get access. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash Battleline to get 15% off. Thank you, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering our listeners a natural remedy for some of life's most common health issues. Also, this show is brought to you by Photonis Defense the global leader in night vision solutions, providing more high quality night vision capabilities than anyone. Hunters, shooters, boaters, and outdoor enthusiasts rely on Photonis defense systems to make their adventures safer and more successful. Military, law enforcement, and public safety end users utilize Photonis defense solutions to give them the edge at night in tactical situations and rescue operations. Photonis defense is now offering the state-of-the-art night vision systems from the PD Pro B 16 millimeter binocular and the PD Pro M 16 millimeter monocular to the PD Pro Q panoramic night vision system. Customers from all over are excited about these new, smaller, lighter NVGs. You've got to see these things to really experience how much smaller and lighter they are than anything you've used previously. When I was at SHOT Show, there were SEALs, there were other guys in the special ops community just blown away by what they're doing. So check them out, photonisdefense.com, P-H-O-T-O-N-I-S-D-E-F-E-N-S-E.com for more information or look for Photonis Defense product options from your night vision dealer. And as uh, Jade Struck said when she was on, I think we have some credibility being one of the only podcasts with a night vision yeah. sponsor. I love it. Yeah. Uh, with that, let's get right into everything. From Omaha, Nebraska to New York City, from planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Twitch is on. Motherfucker, I'm going to shoot you in the face. 
Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. <laughs> you are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast. The switch is on, Battle Line Podcast, and uh, as promised, we have some news to get to in the special operations community because that's what we do um, before we get to Holly McKay. We've got some positive news, I would say, and then some tragic news. I, I don't know what you want to get to first. Whatever you want. You know I'm just here. I'm just I'm just the pretty face on the radio, or the podcast, I should say, so... You're the, you're the man. No, but I mean, there's these are big pieces of, of news right yeah. now. I, I I guess I can well, let's, start, let's start with, with um, let's say, let's end with the good news. Let's not end with the bad. News. <laughs> before we get, get to news. Holly, well, I mean, the tragic news, of course, is uh, and and mo- many of you guys have probably heard about this. Navy SEAL candidate Kyle Mullen uh, has died this past week during Hell Week training at uh, 24 years old. Previously, he played football for Yale University, and I feel like. Uh, Every year or every other year, we hear about guys dying during these training exercises. Well, it, you, a lot of times in the it, field. Well, and it's it, you got to you got to understand and put it in perspective here. It, being a SEAL, a Ranger, Delta, ODA, with SF, a PJ, combat controller, the, it's arduous training. It's hard training. It's supposed to be hard training, and it physically pushes you. And, and sometimes people die. You don't want to have anybody die in training. No commander says we're going to push him so at least somebody dies today. That's not no. In fact, one is too many. And every commander, every person I've been with that I've served with will say the same thing. But we also are realistic. We also know that the training will push your physical food, push you physically and mentally to your limits. And and there are people there are times that people pass away. I, mean, I remember in 95 when I first went into the military. Um, that was the first we had four guys die at Ranger School. That was the big news because they died of, of hypothermia in Florida, which was you would think you'd die hypothermia in Florida, but they died in hypothermia in Florida phase. And, and you know, it, it, it's, it, it, it happens. So I, I just, I don't want to downplay it, but I also am real, you know, where I'm a realist as well and know that this, this isn't going to be the last time either. Uh, you know, I wish it was. And no matter what safety measures you put in, the training is that difficult. It is that hard. And no, and this, you know, he was a former football player, or actually a football star at Yale when I, and I played college football, and I know I was in good shape in college football, but it's a different kind of shape. It really is. When you, and and also, it's it can happen to the to the best of best of us, and it can happen to even, you know, of course, the ones that aren't in the greatest shape when they first go in. It's just that's how it needs to be because war doesn't care what kind of shape you're in. It doesn't care what your mentality is. It doesn't care what the bleeding hearts here in America want us. War doesn't care. Bullets don't care. And if you're not pushed to those limits. Um, then you're not going to respond and act as you should when you are, if you ever are in a combat situation or a situation that you're under duress in a Middle Eastern country or a South American country, whether you're fighting terrorists or you're fighting the cartel or you're kicking in doors in South Chicago. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be able to respond if you're not pushed to those limits. And sadly, you know, every once in a while, somebody will die. And again, that it, it hate me if you want guys, or maybe I'm cold. I'm a cold, heartless shithead. That's fine. You can call me that. But every one of us that joins knows. That I don't think anyone will do that. But every one of us that joins and everyone that you talk to, you know, the political statement is we never want to have it happen. It shouldn't have happened. We put, we're going to put new safety measures in so it doesn't happen. I, I don't care who you are. If you're the speaker for the military or so forth, you can say all that mumbo jumbo that you want when it comes right down to it. The training needs to be that hard. Not that you're going to kill somebody, but the training needs to be that difficult that you are pushed mentally and physically to your limits. Because I'm telling you, and there's a lot of guys that have been shot at more than I have, but I'm telling you when the shit hits the fan and you are fighting for 13 hours, you're going to flick back and go, God, I am so glad that they kicked my ass when I was coming through vetting or when I was coming through training or going through ranger school or going through buds or going through hell, going through selection with SFAS or going through rope or RASP is what they call it now for, uh, for to become a seven fifth ranger. I am so glad they beat the shit out of me because this is easy. 
And it really is. It's like, you know, if she had 13 hours, who gives a shit? I know they're shooting at me, but I remember having to do this for 90 days. I can get through this. This is fine. Uh, but again, sadly, who, who it's, you know, our bodies, physiology, biology, whatever. Sadly, some bodies just can't handle it and they break down. Even at the best case that you're in the best shape of your life. It just happens. And I don't know what else, you know, I, I didn't get into the reading if there's been an autopsy done. There's not much. There's not much out there. I mean, I think it's it's just obviously sad for the families because mm -hmm. I think losing uh, a child in combat is one thing. It's what you sign up for, as you always say. But I don't think anyone wants to lose their child in training. And then also the fact that um, we've had guys on the show say this. I mean, I really can't recall which episode, but something that pushed guys through ranger school or through buds that I, I, I know we've heard it on the yeah. show is, well, they're going to push me, but I know they're not going to kill me. And I think that's embedded in guys' heads. It's, you know, I know they're not going to kill me. So I don't think anyone goes through training expecting that that could you happen. You know what? I, I never, honestly, there were times where I was like, holy shit, this is dangerous, especially in mountain phase of ranger school. You're like walking up the side of mountains, emaciated, droning, and all you have to do is take a slip and down you go off a cliff. Um, I'll be honest, Ian, I, I never, that's nothing that ever I ever thought. I was like, well, it's a possibility, but I accepted that possibility. I accepted that. And maybe that's the old school way of thinking compared to the new old school way. Well, they're not going to kill me. I was like, well, I never thought, well, they're not going to kill me. I just like, well, I accept what happens. This is it. This is what I signed up for. I don't want to die. I'm not going to try to die. I'm going to, they're going to put me in the best situations I can be, but is there a chance this Blackhawk could go down? Yeah, what can you do? You know, best technology in the world, Blackhawk still crafts in training actions. Is there a chance where we're doing a fast rope at night and you can't see a stump that the rope's sitting on? So when you fast rope down before you hit, you hit that stump and your spine goes through the back of your head. Why am I saying that? Because that did happen to a ranger who's doing joint readiness training in Fort Polk. Uh, you know, it, it happens. Uh, so I don't know if I had that mentality. I, 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 I never, I, you know, I, I always knew that there was a possibility. I didn't expect it. I didn't concentrate on it. I never were like, oh my God, I'm going to die. This, I never thought that, which is part of why the training is so great is because when you are getting shot at or somebody is trying to blow you up, you're not thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. Because if you do think like that in combat, you're going to die. You, do, yeah. you're, you have to have that ability, mental toughness to push it out of your head. Um, and I, I, I guarantee you, you know, this guy, he looked like a stud. He really looked, I mean, I, he looked like a guy I would have loved to have on my team um, and be, a, and I'm sure he was just f full of piss and vinegar. I can tell you coming out of college football and going in, I was full of piss and vinegar until I got kicked in the nuts <laughs> by much, mm. but it still led to you having a good base for training. I, I just, I think it's just an unfortunate accident and I'm not giving political statements. I'm just saying it's an unfortunate accident and, and, but it happens in special operations training. That's why it's special operations. That's why there is so few. That's why it's so hard. That is why. And but to his family, because I, I, you know, I thought back to my mom. If she would have got that phone call in training, she would have been up, extremely upset in training or war. Um, but to the family, you know, your son is a hero. Your son, as far as my concern, he he made it and he did his duty. He served his country. And he is an example of what others should strive to be. And that's one that pushes your, pushes that pushes yourself to the limit. That is what special operations wants. They don't want guys to die, especially in training, but they want that kind of mentality to come in and go a hundred and hundred percent. And then some, I mean, shit, that's part of the Ranger creed, hundred percent. And then some you're always given, yeah. but um, I, I hope the autopsy comes out. I hope it wasn't like, I don't know how prevalent anymore, Ian. And maybe you've seen stories out there that, you know, that we, we always complain about the HGH being out there or or enhancers or taking too much red, even too much Red Bull stuff that speeds up your heart. Yeah, that, you know, I, I don't I'm not putting that these did that. I just would like. No, well, we don't, we don't know. know. Yeah, we'll, and, we'll, we'll definitely see. But it's possible. So so rest in peace to Kyle yes, Mullen. Yeah, and and I, of course, wanted to mention on, on the positive front. Um, I'm sure many of you guys saw yesterday, either through Instagram or I, I got up in the morning and looking at my stocks, saw uh, ringing the, the bell of the New York Stock Exchange were the guys from Black Rifle Coffee. You know, we've had <laughs> we've had, of course, Marty Scoville on before. We've had Luke Ryan and the whole team is in New York. And uh, for me, man, seeing a group of veterans, a group of special operations guys go from the early days with what we saw, which was um, Article 15 clothing into what became Black Rifle Coffee Company. 
I just think it's such a positive story to see these special ops veterans reach the height of business to have a company that is now a publicly traded stock. Yeah. It was it was very cool to see. And in terms of the guys I know, like Marty Scoven and Luke Ryan, like couldn't be better people. You know, so. I, I I know I've known and worked with Evan Hafer overseas with the agency. He was a GRS guy too, and then we did some training too with Afghani's. So I know Evan personally. Um, I know Matt just bit from being Second Ranger Battalion, even though he came in later than me. Um, he was at a different company. So he was a private when I was actually leaving to become an officer and I was in Bravo Company. But I got to know him and JT very well. And and I would consider them friends. So it's good to see them out there doing that. Um, but full and full honesty, guys, just full disclosure, I hate Black Rifle Coffee. I don't as a product, I don't like it. And I don't wear any of their clothing because I, I don't know. I'm just, I've never been a fan of their business side of the stuff. I, it's not, but that doesn't mean I don't like them and I'm not happy for them because they are, they're, they're good guys. And I know them from before that. And now they're never going to spot. Hey, right? hey, that's We'll find some other spots. I hope they, I want them. Nah, to. You, that's your deal, dude. I'm being fully, I'm not going to sell, <laughs> sell out. I'm not, yeah, not going to sell yeah, out just to bring black rifle. Coffee. But Hey, but on the positive end, you, I know that you've always liked the work for coffee or die that Marty Scovel and Luke Ryan. Marty done, and, so well, they, they, that. Dude, they're, they, they do a great job on the writing side. They're, they're tremendously professional Honestly, they're probably the best, the best media source out there because they get all the information and they put the information out there. And then if there's an opinion piece, it'll be an opinion piece and you know you're getting an opinion, but they're not pushing. Although, hey, I, I will say, I have to say, man, for all the years that I've known those guys, they really do their best to get the full story and to be on the ground there. Like Marty during the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline stuff, the protests, the people who were in favor of the pipeline, Marty was there on the ground. He was talking to everybody and he wanted, he, he didn't want to put out a bias uh, piece. Yeah. He wanted to hear from the Native Americans, hear from the oil companies out there and and get all sides. And and I respect wow. him for it. I mean, Marty's a guy who truly, I, I don't know who he voted for. I don't know everything about his political views. He's a pretty objective guy. I, oh, and that's the that's the Ranger way, dude. That's they're both they're both Rangers, both guys, Marty and 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 Ginger Man. They're both they're both from the Seventy Fifth <laughs> Ranger Regiment, and they live by that credo to this day. It's still one hundred percent Nensa. They're giving max effort to put the best product out there, but that's that's the lineage they come from. That's what they were trained. I'm sure they had that in them before they joined the regiment. The regiment just made that flourish, the Seventy Fifth, and they're still living and and living by the Ranger ethos and the and the Ranger creed to this day by giving 100% and, and never taking short and busting their ass. That's where it's from. And that's why it's admirable. And that's why, again, I, I, I wish the guys all the best in the world because of the friendships I've made with them. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I just want to say, I, I just have never really cared for <laughs> coffee coffee or, the, or their merchandise. But I do I do love that that they are just themselves. I, I, I haven't watched them recently. I know in the beginnings, they were themselves. I hope they've not changed at all. But I know Marty's still just Marty. And and Luke, from what I've met, I met Luke through you, just from the podcast. I didn't know him beforehand. No, but no, if I remember correctly, you defer, your uh, introduction to Luke was when he wrote a piece for That's Coffee right. Your That's right. Yeah, when he wrote the piece, that's where I met him. And, and um. Yeah, Luke came way after. About you and, and Boone, and, or you and I. It was, I, it was, it was, I think it was me and Boone. I think it was me and Boone. Okay. But, but um, yeah, Luke came way after. Yeah, that's I, right. That's right. It was yeah, you and Boone. I, 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 yep, I left. And, and Luke, what I love, Luke, if you follow Luke on Instagram, which I recommend you do, his stories, there's always, he's, I, honestly, I, I write, our stories are similar because we don't just post a picture and say, hey, short description. It's like a full description of what we were doing, what it meant to us, where we were at and how this may help somebody else in the future. I love Luke's post. And, and I think that's how Instagram, honestly, that's how I think social media should be. It should be inspirational. It's like, here's a post of me standing next to this car, but this is what I was thinking. This is what I was going through. And this is how I overcame it. I, 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 it's similar to how I like to do my post on Instagram. Uh, so he, Luke's also a guy who's seen so much of life. Yeah. I feel like from living in yeah. Thailand, from serving in the military, the guys lived all over the United States. Like he looks, he looks like he's 15 years old, but he's lived a lot <laughs> of life. Opie, you know, Opie Cunningham, man, he he's, <laughs> he looks like Ron Howard from between Happy Days and Andy Griffith's show. He's like in that. He's always going to be constantly. <laughs> you would, yeah, you wouldn't think he's an Army Ranger. No, but there's a lot of guys you wouldn't think that are Army Rangers. Either. It's just that's what's so funny. 
when it, when we take all of our gear off, people look like. I remember we one time flying back from Fort Bragg, and our plane, our C five, we were on had some problems, so we had to stop at Fairchild at Spokane to stop because the plane wasn't going to make it to all the way to McCord. And I remember getting off that plane. And we also had our gear on because we just got through doing tra a training evolution. So we got out and we're walking on this Air Force base. We all start wearing our body armor. We have our rucks. Every one of us has our guns. We have live ammunition because it was doing some live fire stuff, um, even though we're, I mean, we're not all loaded up. But we look like we're going to war at Spokane at Fairchild Air Force Base. And all the Air Force <laughs> guys are looking at us like, who are these idiots? I mean, oh, my God. What are these guys? Are they going to cut over? They th I, I think they thought we were probably going to overtake their base. But then as soon as we took our gear off, we went to the chow hall. <laughs> they didn't even recognize us. Yeah, it's they're like, like you're just normal guys. Is that five seven, yeah. 140 pounds <laughs> you turd over there? It, but exactly. but that's 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 the beauty of Ranger Battalion. It's not what you got on the outside. It's it's the inside. It's it's your mental toughness, yeah. your strength, your intestinal fortitude. And again, doing full circle back to 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 the SEAL the trainee that I, that's. I'm sure he epitomized that, and that's why it's so difficult because it, it's not the physical aspects that you have. It's not. It's it's really what you have inside, and it sounds like he just pushed himself to the limits, which is to me is. And I know again I, to his family, I, I, I I'm so sorry for your loss, but I, I, to me that is that epitomizes special operations pushing yourself to the limits. Yeah, and, and absolutely. So. Um, so rest in peace to him and, and congrats to the guys from uh, BRCC. We got to get to Holly McKay. So before we do, got to let you know about our longest time sponsor, Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it will be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states. Just go to the dealer locator on their website, fortscottmunitions.com, and you're going to find a dealer right by you. I mean, here on Long Island, South Shore Sportsman and Merrick, they supply Fort Scott. And, hey, guys, also, let, just to let you know, Fort Scott is starting a, a Fort Defense, a training a training section of Fort Scott, and battle line tactical classes will be falling under and partnering with Fort Defense. So sign up for, you know, on their website. So if you're a battle line tactical uh, supporter, if you want to come train with me and, and my team of instructors, um, you'll get information from the Fort Scott website as well because we're going to be working right here in Fort Scott, Kansas, and they'll be they'll be sponsoring the majority of the uh, training evolutions that we do. So it's always it's, it's a benefit to go on their website and sign up if you follow Battleline Tactical as well, uh, so you know when we're going to be training, what dates, and then you can sign up for courses. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. So check it out, fortscottmunitions.com. And then you can use the exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the BATTLELINE podcast. The link for that is right in the description. And, of course, Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, languages, business, motivation, and more like original entertainment from top celebrity creators and thousands of popular and binge-worthy podcasts. Uh, I especially, currently, I've been reading Will, Will Smith's book, which, by the way, Will Smith did the audiobook for his book. He did the Audible. So for all the you know authors we have on, we're like I don't have time to do an audiobook. Who's more busy than Will Smith? So uh, I don't know if you but you have any recommendations. That's oh, you know, you know, you know, you know who brutally I, honest. You know one. who I recommend. I mean, <clears throat> thirteen hours to Ranger Way, <clears throat> Patriots Creed. Those are my. I, I if you ever heard of them before, that, that's my recommendation on book books. Uh, and except for thirteen hours, I also did my own 
Oh, the audible. Yeah. I do my own audio books. And, and that's, that's, and that's a pain in the ass. Holly McKay. And, yeah, Holly. Holly McKay we're about to have on. Yeah. If you want to check out her book, Only Cry for the Living, she did the audible. So you get to hear that Australian voice uh, on, uh, she, on her. I, She's got a great Audible voice. has everything out there, guys, from the military to 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 entertainment to, you know, I, I, is, Jack, is Jack Carr, is his books on Audible? They are, aren't they? Yeah, oh, okay. everything, of so, course. So with, with Audible, you can always find the perfect title for whatever you're doing, wherever you're going or whatever you're feeling. Audible allows you to find audiobooks that will inspire, delight, help, or simply entertain you. With Audible, you can listen while working from home, cooking, exercising, on a walk, as a family activity, or just relaxing. And now with the new Plus catalog, an Audible membership is so much more valuable as it gives all members a chance to listen to and discover new favorites and new formats, like the exclusive Words Plus music series, or a podcast you never considered before. With the free Audible app on your smartphone or tablet, you can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. Audible can help people with their own personal goals, whether they want to learn something new, get more books in their life while doing other things, focus on mind and body wellness, or simply enjoy a well-deserved diversion. You set your own goals and let Audible help you reach them. New members can always try Audible for free for 30 days, so you have nothing to lose so join me and Chris on our Audible adventure. You will always be able to find the perfect title for you. And if you want to check out, like I said, Holly McKay's book, go right there right now. Uh, simply visit battlelinepodcast.com slash audible. That's battlelinepodcast slash A-U-D-I-B-L-E, battlelinepodcast.com slash audible. So joining us for the second time on Battleline Podcast, because we loved having her on the first time, and your following is just like shot up since all the other shows that you've done, you know, Jocko, Jocko writing the intro to the book. The book has done so well. Uh, war mm -hmm. reporter, author of Only Cry for the Living, uh, and also the ambassador for Burnt Children Relief, Holly McKay, still have the book over here. And we were just advertising that if you get it on Audible, you could hear your lovely Australian voice on the book ah. itself. So it's great to have you back on. Thank you for having me. It's fun to be uh, back. Of course. Are you going to be awake? You have coffee? How long did you sleep on the plane? Uh, I had a lot. Of, yeah, I drank a lot of coffee, <laughs> so I'm good to go. Too much coffee. And just so everybody knows, her teeth are gray. No, they're not. We're playing. It was an inside joke. Yeah. There we. She's <laughs> like gray. they look great. Hey, <laughs> well, honestly, I I wanted to know uh, since you're on, might as well jump into it. My couple questions is. You know, since, and mine's Afghanistan, of course, I, I'd like to know what's going on. I mean, you stayed there after everybody pulled out. You actually stayed there, or at least in the vicinity, for how, a month after? Oh, much was longer. I stayed there. I came back in December. What? So I went to Afghanistan in July, um, and obviously, you know, things yeah. escalated very quickly. Um, but my, my intent was always to stay there sort of through to the end of the year because I, well, I thought in my initial planning that I would be documenting the last month sure. of the U.S. and then them leaving and then looking at the Afghan government sort of standing oh. on its own two feet, which obviously didn't yeah. happen. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I was very committed to stay and um, much to the, I guess, chagrin of my family and friends who would have liked me to have left with all the other journalists in, in August, I felt very strongly that um, that it was just important to, to keep covering. And I felt confident enough at that point with my interactions with sure. the Taliban that I was going to be safe enough um, to continue to do my work. And yeah, so it was it was sort of a quite an adventure because really for the first time, Afghanistan was was open for travel, open, you know, I could travel to every province by road, uh, which was just unthinkable weeks weeks earlier. So um, it was really an incredible, incredible time to be there. We, we've got the, you know, you, the, I'll go ahead, Ian, go ahead first, but I was going to no, uh, Yeah, you could j jump in, but I was just going to say, I mean, the last time we had you on was pretty much exactly a year ago. I was looking just about, give or take a couple of weeks. So it's like you were on at the very beginning of the Biden administration and he committed, we're going to pull out by this date, by 9-11. And I'm just wondering, as someone who's been there as long as you have, like, did you see things becoming as disastrous as they were in terms of how the execution was of pulling out of Afghanistan? I think the writing really was on the wall for a long time. And I know with me, in the times that I, the years that I've been covering Afghanistan, I was beating my drum about corruption. I really, really feel very strongly that corruption, especially in Afghanistan, 
that was the the evil that allowed the Taliban to come back. And you just saw it on every possible level, from the top to the bottom and right down to the military. So on paper, they may have had 300,000 soldiers. So everyone thought, oh, you know, they, they can yeah. um, push back the Taliban. When in reality, that was never the case. In reality, they may have had uh, a third of that because the commanders, when, when a soldier would die, the commanders would basically take their bank card and continue to get their paycheck every month and, and put soldiers on the books that never existed or had long left the forces. So. On paper, it looked like that they were strong enough to hold a country, but in reality, that that never that wasn't the case, and that really again comes down to corruption. And you also, when you have a group like the Taliban that are really pledging, and and that was one of the, Mullah Omar's very founding tenets was that they were fighting against the corruption and the looting and the stealing that was happening in Afghanistan after that first civil war. So that was their way that they were able to recruit people and even people that weren't ideologically aligned with the Taliban were so sick of their own government taking money from them. And I would say this to Afghans all the time, you know, that's my money. You know, your role, you're driving around Kabul in a, you know, some sort of fancy car with money that should have gone to the Afghan people and it never did. And yet for some reason, the United States government was just always very aware of this. And anyone who I'm sure you know, Tendo, anyone who's worked in Afghanistan is aware of this, but nothing was ever done about it. So to me, it really wasn't that big of a surprise, maybe the speed of which the Taliban took back the country. But beyond that, it was sort of inevitable because it was such a fragmented government with that was so blinded by by its own desire to, to line its own pockets that it was never unified and it was never yeah. going to have that kind of strength to to stand on its own. So it really was just a matter of time. Why, you know, and I didn't, I, I don't, you know, I, I kind of got out of the media. I don't do a lot of it anymore. I don't follow a ton of it anymore unless Ian tells me or, you know, you shoot me something over on a text and I can read it. Um, but why do you think that, that wasn't put out more. Why I, it was always put out that the Afghanis had 300,000. We're putting that number out there, but you know, I knew that wasn't that high. You've obviously knew that wasn't that high. Why wasn't that put out more within the mainstream media or within, or if it was, I just, yeah. I didn't see it, but that, why weren't the, didn't somebody come out and say, and say just what you just said before we pulled out instead of after we had pulled out. Yeah, and if you, if you go through the cigar reports, the Inspector General, that was the number one thing he was saying for a long time. So it was certainly it was put out there, but but again, this is this is the problem we often have when the Pentagon was engaged in this war for 20 years, they wanted it to make it look like it was some sort of victory. They didn't want it to make it seem like we'd spent 2 trillion dollars <laughs> on and countless blood and treasure on something that was a complete failure. So it gives this sort of PR spin of, but you know, every every new general that would come in every couple of years, oh, you know, we're seeing victory, we're seeing victory. Well, anyone on the ground could see that we weren't seeing victory. And yet it was this constantly repetitive line that just kept coming and coming and coming. And until the point where, you know, it was going to implode. So I think it was this sort of desire to to spin Afghanistan as some kind of success. And that really happened with every administration yeah. and every general that kind of came in um, on top of that. And then I, I, I think the U.S. sort of looked at the corruption issue because it is just so prevalent, not just in Afghanistan, but really in so many countries we work in as just being the systemic thing that there's nothing we can do about instead of looking at it as really a root cause of the problem. And I could say this about Iraq and Syria yeah. and many other countries, but instead of looking at it as a root cause, we just look at it as some sort of byproduct that we can't really do anything about. Um, and I, I just hope if we learn anything out of Afghanistan, that is the number one takeaway, that there there has to be some sort of zero tolerance policy. If we're going to give aid, we're going to send troops in, whatever it may be, that that corruption needs to be nobody was ever held accountable. No, you're right. To, you're right. I saw it. I, you know, there was there was ghost hotels in Kabul where contractors would come in and just take millions and tens and of millions of dollars to, to build a hotel or to build a road. And then they would subcontract it out to someone else who would subcontract it out to someone else and they'd use a bunch of shitty materials and then they'd leave halfway the job was done. And the U.S. would just shrug and go, "Oh, okay, well, that was a, a, a waste." But but no one was no ever one held out, yeah, to the camera. So yeah, it just it became it just became a system, and 
And it just, you know, that to me was just was the death of Afghanistan because the the people that needed help never got it. Um, And we created this completely artificial economy. So basically you're looking at 85% of people living there that were either employed by the Afghan government, which was obviously bankrolled by the United States and its allies. Um, They were working for an NGO that was in there, you know, for war purposes, or they were there for a contracting company. And so that literally disappeared overnight. So when the Taliban came in on August 15, and suddenly all of that infrastructure, 85% of people lost their jobs, the entire income just disappeared immediately overnight. And now you're left with this absolute disaster of an economic and humanitarian situation. But it should never have been the case that a country was, you know, artificially propped up in this way and then just sort of yanked, um, you know, and more people really are going to die now in this very brutal Afghan winter than died during the duration of the war. And it's it's just infuriating to me that that we, you know, as the United States of America, as a, as a country that we have invested so much in and so many people have such a personal relationship with Afghanistan and with the people that we were able to walk away in, in such a not only horrific fashion, but really leave more people to die. And to me, it just that that's the legacy that the U.S. has left behind. And that's heartbreaking. It's, it's, it's almost like we did it nonchalantly. It's like, hey, here, here. I, I always say yeah. I equate it to we go have a party at a, somebody's house and then we leave and let them clean up the mess and destroy everything. Oh, I, 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 you know, I, I saw that a lot. And, I, and Biden is still touting it as some sort of I know. <laughs> in some sort of strange uh you know alternate universe that he's living in he's still going around about this sort of success and and i think afghanistan's understand the fact that you know united states may not be able to be there forever but at the same time you know freezing the assets pull, you know hurting the people that we were there to help even more in the way that we left is it was just really terrible for us. It, 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 I honestly yeah. feel like everything with this administration is an alternate universe. Like not just not just uh, <laughs> Afghanistan. And it's like I try to stay away from the topic because everybody talks about it. But even just the COVID situation, like when you watch the news, like Biden talks about it, like it's still the height of everything. And like we don't know how to treat this. And, and that like, it, you know, you can't have the same narrative that we had a year and a half ago because things have changed. Yeah. And you have and to say, hey, we got, we got these, this right, we got this wrong. And they there's just like no admitting of fault yeah. of where we got <laughs> things wrong. It's the same thing with Afghanistan, as you're saying. So Yeah, it's an absolute disaster. And it's it's a it's a real stain, I think, in 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 you know who we are as Americans that that this has happened. But, but we continually do it. And we are the, I just uh, being a part of that too. And I can corroborate your stories on the money. That was one of GRS's job was to escort tons of money, pallets of money to NDS. So they got the money and, and I know the money was there. Actually, we made a joke of it that the plan to help Afghanistan was to give them more plan. That was our code word was money. And, and, I and, and actually yeah. that was me and Evan. Evan Hafer made that up. I, I, mm-hmm. I don't take credit for that. Black Rifle Coffee Evan, <laughs> he made that up. I said, what's the plan today, Evan? To go give them more plan. I'm like, okay, let's go, let's go do it. But with that, and you know, I just want to add one more point yeah. to that. Something else that really infuriates me, especially um, you know, with the evacuation. So many of these people on different, various different levels that were stealing money for twenty years, like a lot of money that yeah. really should have gone to the people, and now they're living. They've been evacuated. They're living in Western countries. They're crying of the Taliban. I'm sorry, you should be in Puli Chakri. Why are we still? funding you to to for your safe haven when you spent the last 20 years steering stealing our so money all those as all those prime ministers all those all the nds heads uh, makes th- me are they still easy. getting money that's my question are to you i guess you kind of answered it those people that were in power at that time that were taking the money that were friends to the united states that were trying to help the prime everybody the ministers so forth do are they still getting money from the U.S. to live in Western states and to be safe? What's is there? Do you? Um, I don't think they'd be. I, again, I, I don't think they'd be receiving money. But you know, they're here getting the the assistance, the, assistance. the evacuation of the of the United States. And and what's even more infuriating is is there's so many, especially the you know the commandos and the special forces in Afghanistan who really yeah. did the bulk of the yeah. fighting, and they really lost a lot of lives and were you know really people that I have a lot of respect for and, and they're, they're not eligible for evacuation. That's what... They're at an extremely high risk um, of any sort of retaliation, but 
they weren't eligible and yet, you know, again, you've got girls and women who can't go to yeah. school and they weren't eligible for evacuation. So you just sort of had a whole bunch of people that, that were military age men that, that really you're either fighting for your country or, you know, and they're the ones who sort of been evacuated. And that also to me is that there were, they just didn't appear to be a very robust vetting program. There was even one case um, when it was all happening of a, a Pakistani truck driver who'd heard about this, you know, crazy evacuation that was happening on the news and thought he wanted to go and check it out. And so he went up to the gates and next thing you know, he's being pulled in and, and next thing you know, several days later, his wife thought that something had happened to him and he disappeared or whatever, and he's calling his wife from Virginia. So, oh, just, like, the insanity of it, it's, it's madness. And I, I still don't understand sort of the, the logic or, or how how the administration allowed such a fiasco I don't, to happen. I don't think you can use the word logic in administration with this administration in the same sentence. So there, I think that's your answer right there. I, I, I really don't. And, and you're right. They just wanted to tout that. And you're right. The victory that we got out in Afghanistan when Biden said we were going to get out. Who cares about what happened to Afghanistan or that we lost what we lost, uh, but that we wanted to be out on this date. Fuck everybody else. You know, who gives a shit? And yeah. that's their victory. Yeah. The, you were there. And that was the same mistake Obama made with the, yeah. the you sort of announcing that drawdown in 2014 when the operation shifted. And so it was the Talibs were like, okay, cool. We're just going to hang out in the mountains, you know, polish up our AK-47 for a little bit, hang out. And then that second that that U.S. flies out, we're, we're back, in, back in gear. Um, so, again, these these time-based withdrawals as opposed to condition-based withdrawals, we don't seem to learn from history. No. We don't seem to learn any kind of lessons from it. And it's it's frustrating. It is. You, you know what I wanted to ask you about? Last week, um, we had Rob Jabber on, but prior to that, we uh, we spoke about the story of that Navy diver who was being held as, yeah. uh, I know as Chris said POW, but he was in active duty. He's actually, I, I think, like 59 years old, but being held by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Mark Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and President Biden said that we're not going to recognize you as a legitimate government unless you hand him over immediately. Do you have any news on that? What do you think is going on? Do you think he's alive? I don't even know if we so, know that. Yeah, I did. I did bring that up several times. And, and I have um, a sort of very good source of mine who was sort of high up in Intel. And and when I first brought it up to him, he um, didn't seem to know what I was talking about. And then as soon as I showed the picture, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have him. Um, I did press to try to get some sort of interview with him, which he said he could initially arrange, but I think Suraj Akhani shut it down. So my understanding is he is alive, but again, it, who knows? I actually, since then, I've had a couple of good friends of mine. I can't say too much about it, but good good Western friends of mine who have been held by the Taliban going on quite a bit of, you know, a couple of months now. Um, and again, you know, we, we're very concerned for them. Um, but they, you know, and the Taliban sort of their MO is just to not deny, deny, deny. So clearly they have Western, you know, political prisoners, so to speak, because they want to orchestrate some sort of trade deal, I would say. Um, you know, I know they've got Norzai, who they really would love to get back. They're sort of their big drug dealer. Um, plus, there's a couple of Afghans left in Gitmo, who I know that they would like to get out. Um, so I think that they are certainly are, are playing the long game in it. But the, sort of the Taliban MO, which is very frustrating, is, oh, no, 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 we don't have them. We don't know who, we don't know who you're talking about. We don't know who they are. Um, when it's very evident that they have these people, usually in intel prisons. So... Um, it, it's sort of just, it's their sort of tip for tat game. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, people have been rolled up in that. And it's, again, the only way through that is through some form of diplomacy. And the U.S., I guess, you know, will have to make some sort of concession uh, to the Taliban in that respect. Um, I think the Taliban obviously really wants international recognition. That's very important. But it also needs to project this sort of air of strength okay. and and being able to to rule um, sort of a country in uh, this sort of new, I guess, what they like to call as a peace period. But I think regardless of whether they released the, the um, mark or not, I don't think that the U.S. is coming close to to recognizing them anytime soon. Do you, being there, we saw a lot of the equipment, a lot of the military equipment being left behind, so forth. Did you... Was it accurate what we're saying here in the United States? You know, we know how our, our media likes to 
almost be a propaganda arm for political parties and it's either yeah. overblown or embellished or it's underblown <laughs> and not embellished enough. Um, did we lose that much equipment and that much sophistication? Did we leave that behind and were they able to obtain it? And is the Chinese and the Russians and Iranians going to be able to get that? That That's a, on the military side. Also, that's a concern for a lot of us um, sure. because our advantage was the technology. You know, fighters are and having them get that would be. Yeah, we did leave a lot behind, really. Um, and and I know that the, sort of the U.S. made a big deal of blowing up a lot of the aircraft and things that were left behind at the airport before they left. But even the, those, some of those have been repaired. Wow. Um, you know, the Taliban have been able to bring in people from, you know, experts and, and just really from the previous government. Um, and that's just because people need a job. You know, these all these military people that were in the, you know, a and they still need a job. And, the, you know, they're really, their only choice is to, to go back into to the military. Um, so I know some of that's been repaired. I know that they at least have um, a couple of Black Hawks, but they do have a lot of the Russian um, MH17s, wow. which they were flying around a little bit. But but just sort of the general, um, you know, uh, having the the you know M16s and and all of that. They they have tons of those, and really they were able just to get those um, even before the fall of Kabul, when you know when every other city kind of fell. Okay. And the Afghan forces left their bases. Um, they were able to kind of seize a lot of that equipment. So, and they really love to dress up. You know, that was the sort of funny thing is that, you know, they're wearing all this equipment that they have no idea what it is. And at one point, I was with my photographer Jake, and we were detained in Spin Boldak, which yeah. is that border area of going into Pakistan. And just because, you know, it was just, and we were fine. We ended up getting released and, and they just thought we were spies or something because we were just attracting so much attention because <laughs> we just would get involved. So I'd be like out trying to do an interview and just everyone would mob you and the Taliban would be out there flogging people and they just didn't even yeah. care. They were just like still following us around. It was like, they just didn't care. I was like, well, at this point, if you're still here when you're being whipped, like what's, what is wrong with you? Um, but anyway, so they took us in and we just kind of gave them hell the whole time. We just sat there and we're, we're looking at these kids with these thermal scopes. And we're like, do you know what that is? Do you know how to use it? Why Why you? Why do you have a thermal scope? And they were like, they eventually got so sick of us. They were just like, all right, get rid of these people because they're, oh. they're making fun of us. But they just have all this equipment that they just really don't even know what to do with. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're probably learning a little bit more now. But at first it was just it was kind of, it was comical really, because, you know, just walking down the street in Kabul and you've got um, just all these, you know, silly accessories as if you're, you know, going on some kind of night raid. Yeah. No, I mean, of course they have a lot of this equipment, as you said, but one thing I will say to respond to what Chris said in terms of like, is it exaggerated? Is any, there, there definitely has been some proven misinformation put out there. I mean, yeah. for example, uh, this was all over and like Senator Cruz tweeted it out that, and you probably saw it like the picture of them in the helicopter. Yeah. I don't know if it was a Chinook. I don't know what type of helicopter. And Ted Cruz is like, oh, they're hanging, you know, Americans from helicopters. Oh, that was and, completely. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was, and, they, and the people, guy was on a harness and it was them basically celebrating yeah. with the guy on the helicopter. But I mean, know, these was, politicians, they don't, they don't fact check. No. Anything they and put there's it out. an extreme amount of, um, a disinformation. A lot of Photoshop photos were going around in the beginning, and people were saying, um, you know, I remember there was this one picture of this woman. She was, you know, in a in a burqa, black burqa, and she was by a man, and she was like chained to this guy. And they were saying, oh, you know, this is this under the Taliban. This wife is chained to her husband walking behind. Well, it takes a quick um, reverse image search, and you see, well, a that's a photo from Iraq in two thousand and three, um, and b the chain has been photoshopped. So people had a lot of interest in in kind of perpetuating this this narrative, and I would even say. Um, and, you know, people hate me for saying this, but it's the truth is that dis despite sort of the mass hysteria, there was no kind of mass slaughter in the streets. The Taliban was not, I'm sure there were certainly isolated cases, but it was very much the exception, not the rule for, for those acts of retaliation. Taliban was not dragging people out of their homes. The Taliban was not really, they had to get a warrant to enter homes. So a lot of this was sort of taken out of context and, and, I think the media that, that wasn't in Afghanistan struggled to get their heads around the idea that it wasn't an insurgency anymore, that from overnight, it literally had gone from an insurgency into something of, of a group that was trying to be a functioning government. Um, and there was a big shift with that. So I think that um, 
you know, that's sort of that, that in sort of saying that truth, people somehow think you're defending the Taliban. And that's not the case no, at yeah. all. They do yeah. terrible things, but it's also important to present the reality, you know, as it is. Because I, I think if I had never been there and I was just sitting and reading Twitter, I would be like, oh my goodness, like this is a, you know, genocide's in the street. It just wasn't the case. Obviously, I wouldn't have been able to be there working yeah, yeah, if, of course. you know, if I felt that that you know I was going to get gunned down, you know, walking outside of my house. And the Taliban were my neighbors, you know, they were next door, they were everywhere. It wasn't like they were suddenly, you know, hiding in little pockets. They were they were as a as main sort of stream as as any other Afghan you would encounter. Do you think the actions were that way that they learned? from when we first went in, if they acted, if they acted the fool, if they acted the aggressive, if they did the oppressive and even the, it is genocidal things that I thought they were doing initially when they were helping mm -hmm. uh, bin Laden. Do you think they learned from that and said, well, you know what, we're not going to do that this time because now the Amer we might feel the wrath of America coming back mm -hmm. in again or Western states too. And here we go again and all over for the next 20 years. We're doing the same thing. What do you think? Absolutely. I think they learned a lot from the first time that they were ruling. They were brutal yep. in the 90s, you know, just absolutely um, brutal with their morality police and, you know, all sorts of yep. things that were happening and women just absolutely being subjugated to the home. Um, it, you know, it was it was a really troubled time. And I do think they learned because there was they were so incredibly isolated during that period. There was no government that was more pariah than the than the Taliban in Afghanistan during that time. And so what they never were able to achieve then that they are desperate for now is this idea of international yeah. recognition. They want to, to have a seat at the UN. They want to be perce perceived as this sort of legitimate governing force. And they're very aware of the fact that they're not going to be able to, to do that um, without, you know, being a lot more, uh, you know, having learned a lot from the 90s. But at the same time, they're sort of at this double-edged sword where they also can't appear as though they are... Uh, cowering too much yeah. to what the, the international community demands of them. So if, if we say you've got to abide by human rights, you've got to do X, Y, Z, they, to save their own face, they don't want to be sort of told what to do. So they're in this sort of quagmire of wanting the international recognition, but also wanting to rule Afghanistan the way that they sure. see fit, which is, you know, not exactly um, in line with international sure. uh, human rights. <laughs> And do you think eventually because of that quagmire they're in that eventually it's going to come to a head and we're going to do something and straw is going to break the camel's back and they're going to go back to that brutal regime because obviously they're not going to make us happy with human rights and how we are with human rights and it's never going to be happy with the Western world. They're never going to do what we want them to do. But also we're never going to allow the Taliban, at least I hope not, to be that brutal of a regime again. So they're just going to keep finding that no-win situation and finally just say, screw it. We're just going to go back to being brutal because yeah. that makes us aggressive. That shows us how tough we are. Mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion on that? And if so, how long would it be? Well, I know this is I know this is complete opinion, I, I, but I'm curious. Yeah, no, I think, no, it's definitely, um, I think it's definitely a, a plausible thing. I think that I don't know how long the Taliban is sort of willing to ride it out a little bit, so to speak. Um, their process really, of course, now they have a quote unquote acting government, which could go on for years. We don't know. Um, and their process is they get a jirga together. So they get all these Islamic scholars together and these men determine whatever the rules is. So however, they're going to interpret Sharia. So whatever, you know, what's the dress code for a woman? What is the punishment for X, Y, Z? And it's this jirga that, that has to convene and, um, establish that, but that hasn't happened yet. So I think it's just sort of this waiting period is really still dragging out a little bit. I did notice toward the end of my time there that they become a lot more authoritarian. So in the beginning, it was this sort of crazy wild west. You would literally just you could walk to a ministry and and suddenly be like, I I walked up to a suicide bombing school and knocked on the door and said, Hi, I'm a journalist. I'd like to come in and see what you're doing here. Um, and they sort of looked and said, well, you're American? I said, well, I, you know, I am American Australian, but I had my Australian passport. So they said, I said, oh, I'm Australian. And so they said, okay, come in. Um, so I went in and, you know, was able to kind of do this story. And it was just so bizarre how easy the whole thing was. Um, but as the time went on, you noticed that there was a lot more of a bigger crackdown. They wanted 
you know, they're trying to get you to send questions in advance. You know, I talk to um, the Hakanis and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'll interview, but I need questions. I'm like, I don't do that. So they just, they were becoming increasingly paranoid about um, wanting uh, to control everything and wanting to control the situation. And, and, and Intel was suddenly coming up to me in a cafe and saying, who are you? What are you doing? I don't think you're a journalist, da, 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 da. And, you know, I'd go and file a complaint about them and they'd be in trouble. So, you know, it was this just constant fight. But there was a big shift where you suddenly started to feel like, okay, these it's becoming a lot more of a dictatorship now. Right. And yeah. I think that, that the Taliban is trying to rein in as much control as well, it can. It sounds like they're becoming politicians then. I mean, that's, a, I yeah, really, that's kind of what, what is happening. Um, so, yeah, I think that the Taliban will give it a period of time, um, but I do think, you know, that, that there is a time limit on that. Uh, and also in the beginning, um, I remember that first month, um, you know, we were getting notification of, okay, well, there's going to be a public execution and people's hands are going to get chopped off. And I think that was all very much in the works. I remember um, there was a Friday that all this sort of hanging was supposed to happen and we we're kind of waiting, you know, is it going to happen? Do we go to the mosque? Do we not go to the mosque? And then it didn't happen. And basically the whole thing, I guess, got squashed. Um, and to my understanding, still now, it, they haven't implemented those sort of very draconian aspects of Sharia law yet um, because they are kind of waiting for that international recognition. But, you know, that, that will run out too um, because that's something that's obviously very important to the Taliban and the way that it sees governance. Um, and, you know, and going back to sort of the, the fake news narrative, I was also, you know, you read a lot about how oh, this public, they're publicly executing, they're doing this, they're doing that. Well, that, that that's not true because that wasn't happening when I was there, and I know that there were some some visuals in Herat of um, a couple of men who were hanging from cranes, um, and that was not a public execution. That what happened in that circumstance is that allegedly that these particular men had kidnapped a bunch of young children, and they got, ended up getting in a shootout with the Taliban, and they were shot dead in the shootout, and then someone decided it would be a good idea to warn other people not to kidnap children by hanging these men from a crane. Um, so, you know, that, of course, got, got twisted in, in the media narrative as well. But um, but I think that, yeah, it's only a matter of time before the Taliban does sort of bring back um, those, those aspects of Sharia law. It's just, it's not, and quite frankly, there are a lot of countries that implement those laws that we still have diplomatic relationships yeah. with. So, um, you know, Saudi Arabia yeah. and other places that, that do yeah. those things. And we're still very, you know, sort of tight with those places. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, from the Taliban's point of view, they probably look at it and think, well, you know, if other countries are doing it yeah. and still sort of international, whatever, then, then why can't we? So yeah. it's a difficult game. It's extremely mixed signals. You know what I wanted to ask you, kind of separate from this, but just on, on a personal level, you know, before we recorded, you said you were back in D.C. And just like looking at your Instagram and, and all the stuff that you report on, you're someone who's all over the world. Like, it, it's got to be a weird adjustment, I would think, from going to the Middle East, going all over all these countries to just boring Washington, D.C. Like how? Because there's a certain personality yeah. type who wants to go in the middle of the danger zone of the Middle yeah. East and, and report and and interview possible suicide bombers and that type of thing, as you were just saying. Um, yeah, I mean, just I'm wondering how, what, what the whole life is like as a yeah. war reporter doing that. I know, you know, it's always like, it's a feeling of never being settled. I would have happily stayed in Afghanistan and I've got my, my visa to go back and then I'm probably going to go back after Ramadan um, at the end of April, but I would have happily, you know, honestly stayed there. I felt like, um, you know, I had a good little friendship base. There was, um, you know, I loved the guys that, you know, we had these, uh, you know, great chocolates in the house. It's make my shisha. I did my work, you know, go to my little cafe, hang out with my fixer. I, I love that work. I love the simplicity of that life. I love doing, you know, and I'm so... I'm so grateful to have something in my life that, you know, to, to have a job that I love because I know how many people can just never find their feet in life and are always looking for that, that passion. And I'm so grateful to have found it at a young age. And I really, I can't imagine doing anything else, but 
um, I had to come home for a commitment. It, you know, it was a lovely commitment. I was actually receiving an award uh, for a hospital in Afghanistan called Emergency oh, wow. that I do some work with. Um, and so they, it was really important for them for me to come back to New York to to sort of get this award. Um, so I made a commitment to do that. If it wasn't for that, honestly, I probably would have just continued to stay um, out for a, at least a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, it was a difficult adjustment. I think that you sort of come back and you suddenly confronted with with all sorts of, you know, quote unquote problems, like even COVID. I mean, COVID just doesn't exist in Afghanistan. It does, but it's just nobody talks about it. There was even a joke um, where a bunch of as journalists sort of said to Anna Sakani, like even the even the uh, even the COVID ran away from you, you know, because you just don't hear about it in <laughs> Afghanistan. There's no masks. The only people I occasionally see wearing masks, ironically enough, the Taliban. <laughs> I think it's I think they just think they look cool in them or something. <laughs> they're like riding around in the back of the truck with a mask. Whereas, you know, people don't, they just don't wear I think there's a lot of Americans that think they look cool with their little baklavas on too. So. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. So you sort of come back to all this like, okay, this is like what i got to deal with now. Um, but I had a lot of writing to do. I had, you know, book work to do. So I really um, was able to kind of just have a bit of quiet time and immerse myself into that. Um, and then I had some work that sort of came up uh, this month, oh, last month in um, Albania. So I was planning just to kind of go and do do that. And that was more of a long form project. And then obviously things were heating up with, uh, with Russia and Ukraine. So I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I was determined to at least stay away from it for a little while, but I really just couldn't. <laughs> so, um, I ended up yeah, going from Albania to Ukraine for a while. And I, I just came back and I'm keeping an eye on it to see whether I need to go back soon. I've got my bag ready in, in case I do. But it is hard because you do you do I just I do love it I do love this idea of being on the road I do love um the work that I do the people I meet just it's just fascinating to be this part of this rough draft of history but at the same time there's also as you get older there's a certain part of you that wants a, a degree of stability yeah. or, or starts to think about okay you know I'm at the age where I've got to decide if I want a family or not or how would I manage to do this job and there are all these things that are really really difficult and I think those things also weigh on my mind and I, I don't, I'm still trying to figure it all out. I certainly see women that, that continue to do this job, you know, with children and, and those sort of Which is incredible. I mean, really, yeah, that children going that like I, to the Middle East. Yeah. yeah, and it's something I, I want to be able to do. You know, I certainly, you know, want to be able to to be a mom and to be able to have that sense of stability, but I just love what I do so much. Um that I don't ever plan to 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 sort of give it up. Obviously, you make compromises, yeah. but I I love what I do, and I just it's something you. It sounds cheesy, but you do feel like it it is a calling. It's something you of just. Of course, that's not cheesy at all. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, and, and inspired to do. So I, I did get an apartment in um in Virginia. Just be, I had been living out of a backpack for so long <laughs> since I left New York a few years ago, and I needed some sort of home base because you know it's nice to to have your own space and especially just to be able to focus on work, but. But certainly there's that part of me that just that literally is back, is happy to be back for about two days. And then I'm like, okay, where do I go next? Sure. Uh, yeah, you know, you know what I wanted to bring up because you were talking about Russia and Ukraine. I, I purposely printed this because it applies to you so much, I thought. And I figured we might get into this in terms yeah. of like raw reporting from there. So Brianna Kyler, who's from CNN, uh, tweeted out, reporters who cover the military have been denied the usual opportunity to embed with U.S. troops deployed to Eastern Europe as Russia is poised to invade Ukraine. And now what I thought was interesting and what applies to kind of your mentality is Jack Murphy, who's a friend of the show, Army Ranger Green Beret, uh, replied to that tweet. And what he wrote was, reporters can buy a plane ticket and fly over there. The best reporting comes from those not waiting for the government to give them a hall pass. And to me, like, that's you. You never wait for the government. Yeah, and I pass. think it's definitely, and I certainly have done um, some embeds in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places over the years. And and I certainly enjoy, you know, being able to show the American side and, and, and meeting, you know, a lot of our great men and women. But that's certainly not my preferred style of reporting by any means. Um, I really think that the, you know, for me, what's most interesting is, is really just the people on the ground. You know, again, you can sit with officials all day long and, and I can take yeah, away notebooks yeah. and notebooks of official information. But at the end of the day, the best 
picture that you're ever going to paint of a situation is the is the bus driver is the the man um you know on the corner selling the the balloons is the the guy running the cafe is the driver is that you know that they're the people whose stories that you know i like to tell and so i'm certainly with jack in that um don't wait for the u.s military i mean chances are you can get embedded with them and you just you're stuck doing a bunch of drills or something you know in in poland like you're not um you know anywhere near sort of the the where the heart of the matter is and i think you know, as journalists, and, and that's also what, this is a little bit before my time, but really at the beginning of, of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, that was the only way journalists could go into countries was through these embeds. So the Pentagon was very much able to control the narrative of what was happening yeah. because journalists couldn't just jump on a plane and fly to Baghdad. They had to go with the U.S. military. And I think that's a really dangerous um, slippery slope. Yeah. for journalists to, to be to be completely under that guise of the US military and I think it's very important for us to to spend that time but also be able to be you know very far from that mix and, and be able to go and to speak to people from absolutely every side of the equation and I think that um, you know that's something that has opened up a little bit more now but I, I think it's a dangerous to be only receiving that sort of one track of information you answered my question but I still I'm going to ask it anyway I, I and I forgot, but I think you really did. I should maybe expound on it. If you go with the government, if you run and you're as part of there and they're the ones that are helping you out and sign, they can, and from what I'm gathering, they control the narrative. They really do. And are, is your journalistic integrity being compromised because I'm going per a ticket from the U.S. government or the, the Army, State Department, CIA, so forth? Um, you don't have that problem because you don't do it that way. But from what yeah. I'm hearing... And yeah, I, I'm not, I'm just, I, maybe I'm way off. And I yeah. do feel this. I actually, my opinion is this route. So I'll, I'm not, no, no holds, no holds here. But if you go with the government, then you're, you've got to report kind of, kind of what they want you to report. They're going to give you that side. That's what you're going there. We're paying for your ticket. So you got to put us in a good light. Or do you find journalists still maintain journalistic integrity, even when they're going on the government's dime? Um, I think, you know, each, each, each journalist to their own, and there are some people who are better at sort of doing the balance than others. But I think just sort of you, you just generally have a natural inclination, I think, to, um, you know, if somebody's there sort of guarding you and, and protecting you, then then you have sort of a natural inclination, I guess, okay. to, to, to favor them. Um, and, and not that I ever think journalism, I think neutrality is a little bit of a myth. I think truth is you know is what we always strive for and, and and that can be a little bit distorted i think if you're only taking it from from that one particular side but i do think um you know it's challenging and, and i see it all the time even with journalists that will even favor and it's not just the us but they'll favor certain you know countries narrative in order to because they want to get a visa to that particular country or they don't want to be denied a visa wow. and i see that a lot especially with the iran reporting um you know there are certain things that the, you know that the regime does that are just absolutely horrific and you know certain groups that, that go against them and people won't report on those groups or when they do report on the, those groups they they frame them as being these sort of propagandists and cults and other things. And I have to look at that and think, is that just because you want to get a visa to Tehran? Um, so I think, you know, as a journalist, I'm, I'm very much, you know, blacklisted from a lot of places. I'm sure by the end of my career. I'll be <laughs> but that means you're doing your job. That's awesome. You, you, if world, you're not blacklisted like, at the end of your career, you haven't done yeah, a good enough job, Holly. Come on. I would not be, you know, I'm not concerned what China thinks of me, okay? I don't expect that that I'm ever going to get a visa to go and hang out in Beijing, but that's okay because I'll go and hang out somewhere else. And I think it's a just also, again, it's this dangerous slippery slope where journalists are afraid to to report what certain governments don't want them to because they're worried about, about losing their access or something or, or being denied. And I think that is, if you are so worried about that, then, then don't do this profession. Like, yeah. get out of it. Because yeah, I, you are going to be hated by a lot of people and a lot of governments and a lot of powerful people. And you have to be okay with that. And if you're wanting to be in a profession where you kiss somebody's ass, go and, I don't know, join uh, being yeah, Pretty much any profession. No, I know what you mean. I, but, uh, yeah, of course, people, you know, should pick up your book, Only Cry for the Living. But this makes me wonder in terms of where you're saying, you know, being blacklisted and what you could report on, what people are trying to stop other people like yourself from reporting on. 
Like, where are you doing the majority of your reporting? Because I see so many great journalists now are doing stuff on Substack. They're yeah. Patreon. They're getting funded by their readers. And, and that's why we're getting yeah. stuff that's kind of on the cutting edge that Fox or CNN doesn't want to report. And I'm wondering where you're doing the majority. I have a Substack, so please subscribe to that. I put a lot of stuff out there when I can. Um, awesome. I'm just freelancing for, for different outlets, you know, from New York Post to K News. Um, I have a new sort of, it's, a, it's something that I, it's in the works at the moment, but there is a really great new um, sort of military veterans platform that is going to be launched very soon. So I'm, I'm sort of preparing to kind of uh, navigate a lot of my work pretty much exclusively over to that. But uh, but right now, for me, again, that's the other important thing is maintaining that independence of not being um, beholden to a particular outlet that may have a particular yeah. agenda, that may have a particular kind of way. I, I think, again, being that independent journalist is really important to me uh, because that way you, you're sort of not being pulled to, to spin things in a certain way and you can have that freedom to report things as it is and 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 i think that is um it's a it's a, it's a challenging uh life more so than you know being able to be with one corporation um but i think that it's it's important to journalism and and majority certainly not all but majority of journalists that i see in, in afghanistan in a lot of countries that are really doing um incredible work are are independent journalists and i think um that's an important, you know, it's an important part of, of who, of the direction journalists is taking and the role that we play, I think. So, um, yeah, I certainly appreciate, uh, appreciate that support. And I think a lot of people are sort of tired of the mainstream media narratives and knowing, you know, well, the, you know, Fox goes this way, CNN goes this way, you know, everybody has an agenda. And I think People are really just craving that that non non agenda, non censorship, non um, you know, not not being able to just report as it is without the fear of cancellation or, or backlash. And that's important because yeah. our government. That's one thing they have learned from the outside is that the media and controlling that media is what's going to shape opinions, and it controls it controls the country. So you're getting. I see both those groups you just said they're not media anymore. They're turning into propaganda machines. But that's what we saw overseas constantly with, with the, with the Al Arabia TV sometimes or Al Iraqi TV or even Al Libya or Al Jazeera at time. And I don't know if it's as bad as it used to be when we were there, but you doing this is great because you're taking the power away from those conglomerates out there. And it's not propaganda. Yeah. You're actually giving, you're giving news. It, it's tremendous. Um, and what's, What's concerning now really is social media is sort of jumping on the bandwagon yeah. of, of censoring people too. And I think that is, the, again, it's a dangerous slippery slope to be going down um, when even independent people are, are being silenced if it, if it if what they're saying runs counter to um, whatever the narrative is that, that needs to be spun. And, and even something as simple as, you know, Instagram, you can't hashtag Taliban, otherwise you'll get, you'll get banned. I didn't know that. And I'm like... Yeah, this is just ridiculous. Like, so you you know, constantly coming up with creative, like putting a you know asterisk in there or TB or whatever it is. And I'm like, this is things that need to be reported yeah. on. Like, what what is this? Yeah. Um, just because you're hashtagging something doesn't make you someone who's I've never the Taliban. You know, with an insurgency, it's just like we just got to this sort of silly, ridiculous point um, where we can't actually just have a very frank conversation about a, a group, um, because we have to run around with like weird spellings for things in order to, to project that. And it's, it's a, it's a very Stalinesque um, it, environment. Well, and the that's the perfect word for it. And, I, and it's to me fighting in some of these, these wars, it's scary. Cause I see us going down into that route where, where it is now turning into a dictatorship and I, not in America. I know people are going to tell you're crazy. Even Ian's probably going that he's crazy. It's never going to get, I just, and I just see it. I see it oh, going it's down that route. It's, and this is where it starts. And I may not see it in my lifetime, but if we continue to go down there, that's, that's how it all started I, I, to me. That's how it's how it, that's how it all starts. And that's how oppression really it becomes oppression for everybody. That's not on that upper echelon, regardless of color, race, ethnicity. If you're not in that, hop tier of government government workers then you're you're not 
you're going to be oppressed and, and they're going to control. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't you you couldn't go anywhere this past week or two, really, without hearing about the Joe Rogan stuff. with yeah, Spotify. Yeah. I mean, that's been the big news. And I think the reason that that's bigger than anything right now is this is the first time you have like a White House press secretary saying more needs to be done by these corporations to police this one guy. You know what I mean? And we talked about it with Adam Kokesh on the show previously, like Adam's episode was pulled from Spotify long before all this. When mm. Joe first signed to Spotify, they took Adam Kokesh's episode down. They took a bunch of guys' episodes down. And yeah, I mean, it, that is that is a problem. If you're going to be a free speech platform, you have to be a free speech mm. platform. And uh, the, the problem now is just all these companies pretty much are creating monopoly. And if you want to create a free speech platform like they tried to do with... Um, parlor you know then apple will take you down and then yeah. you can't get you know it's just this never-ending thing and, and it is a problem and that's why more people are using substack like yourself where people can go on substack and and uh subscribe to you but who knows where that's going to go i mean I'm yeah sure I guarantee you, you start you'll start some you know the substacks will start being targeted soon too and and there'll be limits on distribution and threatens of boycotts and it's just it's this ex people don't realize you know, really how unique America has been for a long time in in, in the speech. First Amendment and free yeah. speech and, and how quickly that can be taken yeah. away from you and how willingly people are to have that taken away from them. <laughs> I just think, you know, free thought is, is an incredibly crucial part of any democracy. And if you can't even have a discussion about some of these things that, that, that you know, again, I remember, and I always go back to this, I remember at the very beginning of, of the COVID um, pandemic, when, you know, Trump was sort of, you know, alarmistly said, oh, well, this, this never came from a, a wet market. This was, we think this came out of a lab. He didn't even say it definitively. He said, we're investigating whether this yeah. came out of a lab. And if you put that on Facebook, you would be... Banned, you know, yeah, would be or blocked, yeah. And then... And now, uh, I just that yeah, it's sorry, much finish your yeah. <laughs> that, That's true. That nobody talks about yes. the wet market anymore. Um, and I think we're, we've all sort of come to a general consensus that it's highly likely that this uh, came out of a lab leak. So, again, it just sort of, and yet that's just seamlessly kind of um, pushed under the, the rug. And I just think, you know, these, these were narratives that were driven by social media, by mainstream media. And even when they're proven to be true, they just kind of get ignored and, and, and brushed away. And I just think it's a it's a dangerous, um, you know, it is a dangerous time to be living in because I certainly, I would hate to think, um, you know, that we would end up with some kind of state controlled media that you see um, in so many parts of, of the world that I work in. And, and to be able for, for people who really want to seek the truth, the, the hoops they have to jump through to get VPNs and all sorts of things and, and at very high risk to their lives just to be able to to get a full picture of what is happening because they know that they can't get that from their very tightly controlled uh, state TV and, and banned sort of uh, social media windows. Uh, that's I, I was also just going to throw in there beyond the Joe Rogan thing. I'm sure both of you guys have heard of as well, the whole thing going on with GoFundMe and the uh, Canadian yeah. truckers this past week. I mean, that's been crazy too that, you know, they were going to originally not only pull the GoFundMe, but the people who donated yeah. to the Canadian truckers, they were going to donate that money to causes of their choosing, which to me sounded it's illegal. outrageous, isn't it? It yeah. sounded outrageous and, and quite honestly illegal to me. I, I don't know how that could be legal. If I donate money to this cause and then you take my money and donate to another cause, then you're just taking my money. So uh, obviously they backed off of that, I'm, I would guess for legal purposes, but that's a huge problem too. And now People are donating Bitcoin to the Canadian truckers. And at the same time, you have the current government saying we need to start regulating Bitcoin. Yeah, it, it's just it's just full spectrum dominance would be the term I would use to dominate all forms of currency, all forms of, of uh, audio platforms, <laughs> literature yeah. platforms. It's just it, it's a really strange time that we're living in, for sure. It is. And I just I, I just wish people had a appreciation for for the US and for what um, you know for what our constitution essentially allows us to do and really just you know even being able to freely criticize a Biden freely criticize Trump freely criticize you know whatever government figure even if it's in a you know a really awful and defamatory way but you can do that and not go to jail you can do that and and um, 
and know that you can sleep soundly that night. Whereas in a lot of countries, yeah. um, you would be conveniently disappeared if you did that. And that's the pro that's, that's the route I see we're going if we continue to let this happen with the, with with the governments controlling the media, controlling what we hear, what we say. Um, you honestly, Holly, and people like you, to me, are on the front line. You're, you guys are the ones that the independent uh, writers, uh, the, the Joe Rogans that have, have a greater following than the, the mainstream media because he just he, he tells the truth. I, I'm not a big fan of Joe Rogan, but I do know he tells the truth just like you do. What do you say and how do you get more of the younger generation that's coming up? How do you get them on board? How do you get them on board and say, hey, we need to stay true to the truth and not what these conglomerates want us to say, even though it may yeah. be against the government, because you've seen what happens to people that go against the government in these dictatorship countries or these control where they control the narrative. How awful it is you just mentioned to it? But you're the ones that are going to going to keep the fight and going to win it. And honestly, I'll be honest with you. It's, it's y'all. So at yeah, your, and it's, so it's, what do you say? It's a, you know, at the public education system, you look at universities, you look at, um, you know, there there is a lot of, you know, there is a terrifying movement to, to really silence people and I or to to spin a certain narrative and, and that is concerning with the younger generation because that is sort of constantly what they are being exposed to and, and the fr freedom of thought is you know. It's just so important that that ability to critically think, and in order to critically think, you have to be able to access all kinds of information. And if you're only able to access, um, you know, what is sort of being th shoved down your throat, and it's a very sort of clear agenda on that, then then that is a it's a very scary prospect. And I think that's where you know parents and um, communities and it has to play kind of a role in a in a child's life in in that way and in, in doing their best to ensure that they're the they're receiving a lot more than what they're getting sure. just at, at school every day. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. You said you're in Ukraine. We haven't got to that yet. I know we're running long. Um, I, I want to know what's, how long were you there, first of all, before you came home? And then what's going on? What's really going on there? Not what everybody was seeing on TV. What are you seeing? So, again, it's it, I was there about 10 days. But, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm t deciding to go back. You you're going to go back. You're not just, you're going back. I know you are. I, yeah, but I, I'm only going back if there's action. <laughs> can't sit in a hotel room for two eating borscht all day um but i okay so there's really only one person that knows so as much as every analyst out there wants to spiel about their knowledge of this 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 and this only one person knows what is going to happen in the coming weeks and that is mr vladimir putin he is holding the cards he's the one who's going to make the decision as to what action russia takes um, so it, it's an interesting place. So obviously, um, what, what a lot of people don't, don't realize, they just sort of see, well, on the news that there are these Russian troops around Ukraine's borders, um, and it's this sort of stalemate possible conflict. But what people don't realize is that Ukraine has already been essentially at war with Russia for the past eight years in the eastern region called Donbass, which I went to. And I mean, it's, it's an intense war, I think. Uh, more than 14,000 people have died, and, and there are some villages there that are completely destroyed. I mean, the level of shelling in, in Donetsk, which is, is sort of controlled by the pro-Russian separatists, is, is just, it's every day. Um, so it's, it's very intense for the people living there. But I think this has been going on a long time, and so it certainly isn't anything new. And I do have questions in that Russia has had troops basically stationed around Ukraine's border and more than 100,000 of them since April of last year. And it wasn't a news story then. It wasn't a news story, you know, at all until the beginning of this year. And really the only additive to that was that the positioning changed a little bit is in the troops moved a little bit closer, but also the Belarus tra training exercises were added, which are going on at the moment. Uh, Russian troops are training in Belarus, um, you know, training exercises. But that was really the only additive. And suddenly it sort of became this massive crisis point in January of this year when the situation hadn't necessarily changed all that much. Um, this again, this is this was a stalemate since April. And so certainly it could stay that way for a really long time. Russia could potentially add 100,000 troops to those areas and it would still not necessarily mean that they're going in. It's just, it's an intimidation tactic. Putin likes to intimidate. He likes to assert a certain level of strength. 
And so my concern is now, because it is such a crisis point, does he feel that he needs to save face by taking a bigger action and in some way or shape going into Ukraine and, and taking parts of it, um, which he's certainly done in the past. And, and it is a possibility he may try to do that. Um, he doesn't seem to care so much about sanctions. He would probably lose the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is his energy into into Europe, which Russia makes a lot of money from, which the US have said, if you go in any way into Ukraine, we're going to make sure that that doesn't go ahead. And that would be a big blow to him. But I don't know if it would be enough to necessarily deter him. Russia has been very strong about saying, we don't really care about sanctions. We're going to do things how we want to do things. And and Putin sees himself as a czar. He sees himself as being the, the person who's going to reunite, um, you know, the old USSR. And, and Ukraine is obviously a big part of that. And he didn't really get much blowback when they took Crimea in 2014. And even with the current war that's happening in eastern Ukraine, which they deny that they're involved in, but it's very sort of evident that they are supporting and funding um, these pro-Russian separatists to control these areas. Um, but even that really hasn't brought about any major ramification against the Kremlin. So I, I think that he's really holding the cards and in many ways, he's already won. You've got the US saying, everybody get out and, and evacuating diplomat staff and, and really, in my view, taking a very weak stance with things. And I think that in that way, Putin's already won. He's already able to assert a certain degree of dominance um, over the region when you have you know, a major superpower like the United States that's, that's backing right. down. So I think, again, it's, it's a touch and go. He, he may choose to go in. He's got a very limited window of time because um, sort of by the end of February, the ground starts to melt and you get these awful rains and basically the trucks cannot, the, the tanks cannot move over that. So if he's going to go in, it really has to be something that happens in the next few weeks. Um, if not, you know, it's probably going to again be delayed, but I don't, it's just a mixed bag. I'm hearing very mixed things. Some, some officials in, in Kiev are basically saying, you know, the plans are going to happen. It's going to go happen within the next week. Um, they don't really know. People are talking about maybe he'll encircle Kiev and demand concessions. Maybe they'll just expand from the east. Um, it could even be cyber. It doesn't necessarily have to be a kinetic war. But other people are sort of like, yeah, it's business as usual. And certainly when you're in Ukraine, people don't act scared. You know, in a lot of countries, there may be this mass panic of people trying to to flee and get out. Ukrainians certainly aren't doing that. And, and they have this very extraordinary, you know, what a lot of them say is their second amendment there, even though that's not the technical term, but that they look at the US and they look at this idea of being able to arm themselves. And a lot of the Ukrainians you'll meet will say, you know, I got my gun and, and I will fight and, and the women and the men, and they do these sort of weekly guerrilla trainings to, to, you know, so you have this incredible sort of civilian population that's certainly not willing to to cower to um, a Russian invasion. And so whilst being drastically outnumbered and, and certainly Russia has many, many more troops and many, many more, um, you know, military equipment to you know, annihilate Ukraine if it wanted to, um, Ukrainians have this very strong spirit of, of wanting to fight. So um, it is business as usual there. And I think that there is also an effort by Kyiv to not inflame the situation too much because they are concerned about the economy and the ramifications that's already having. Um, and then when you go to the east, when you go to the actual front lines in the war, people are sort of shrug and say, well, I've been living with this for eight years. So what's the difference? Um, so I think a lot of rhetoric is, is coming from, from the White House now, and I'm not sure that it, it is sort of in the best interest of Ukraine and whether it is really reflective of what's happening. And again, only Mr. Putin knows that. Wow. Uh, I, I got I got one more thing. That's it. I, I was my, they were going back to Afghanistan, though, and this is dear, dear to my heart because I, I was lucky enough to be working in Afghanistan for quite a while when the little girl started to be able to go back to school. That was so yeah. awesome to see in their little outfits. And it, it honestly, I remember the first day I saw it and I was driving to the airport uh, in Kabul and I saw in her little, it looked like a little Catholic school girl outfit with books and a yeah. backpack. I saw the little girls walking down the road. Then on the other side, I saw the Olympic Kabul Olympic cycling team on the other side with their jackets on. And I was like, oh my gosh, we are, this country's getting, I mean, to me, I felt like, wow, two years have been here and this is awesome. I, this is amazing. Um, you, you, and I know the, the girl, the women aren't able to go to school anymore, attend school anymore. What, 
I, I just want your input on that because to me that that breaks my heart. That that to me is yeah. whatever else goes on that pisses me off more than anything to see yeah. that yeah. progress. And we don't report, and none of our media reports on that. And that should be with us. We're, we're so we're so yeah. we're so sensitive yeah. to gender and ethics, and, but yet we're not going to talk about that at all. I, I, so, what's your opinion? It is heartbreaking. And mind you, in public schools, go. I mean, in private schools, girls can still go. So the, there's a lot of private Good. schools that are still open, a lot of closed, but but girls can still go. Fortunately, uh, there. But public schools, Taliban came in, and and basically, you know, after. I think it's, you know, fifth grade or, you know, sort of when the point of, of when a girl kind of reaches adolescence, they can't go to school anymore, which is high school. And um, and then some of the universities, the public universities too, uh, they keep sort of saying it's temporary. They keep saying it's because we have to make sure that it is gender segregation, which in, in most cases, the schools were gender segregated in high school anyway. Um, and then they have another excuse of, oh, but we've got to make sure there's separate transport. And I said, well, you know, you can call a bunch of people, they'll donate a bus, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, but it's just constant excuse after excuse. And I think that um, that's a real sort of sticking point um, for them. And, and it's, a, it's sort of maddening and it's a shame. And it certainly does, as time goes on, um, you know, it does wane from the, the media limelight, just as all of Afghanistan has really waned from the media limelight. And it is heartbreaking because um, it's, you know, it's, it's something that can be so easily fixed. And it's something, unfortunately, the Taliban has just sort of dug its heels in on. And, and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what the remedy is. There were certain cases where schools would open in certain provinces and then they'd close again. So I think there's definitely a willingness to, um, for local govern governments and, and Taliban, I remember being in Host and the government there taking me around to show me these schools and universities. And they, they, this was back in October, and they were like, "We just we were ready for the girls to come back," but yet they had to wait for Kabul to kind of initiate wow. that decision, and so that was really frustrating for a lot of them too. And again, that also goes back to very early sort of complaints that that we had in, in why the U.S. set up a central government the way that it did, um, when clearly Afghanistan is, is such a tribal oh, yeah. place and, and different ethnic rivalries that making all the decisions from Kabul wasn't necessarily going to serve the Afghans' best interest. And, and again, not that the Taliban is running by that, um, you know, the government that we installed, it's certainly not, but that, that mentality of all the decisions have to come from Kabul is still there. And so I think it's a, it's a shame because I think a lot of the local governments at least would sure. would have girls back in a heartbeat if they could. So uh, I hope they do because I was that to me that touched my heart. It, it still sticks to me. I can still see the picture vividly that first day, and then working in Kandahar and having to respond when when a Taliban threw acid. I was in Kandahar when they were when they threw acid in the little girl's face that was going to school. Ugh. And uh, so being a part of that and being on the ground and you see it all the time. And I, so I know you, I know you know what the feeling is, but seeing some progress being made in a country, it, it kind of makes everything worse worthwhile, but then seeing us regress, that's when it really hurts. It, it means like, did I spend all that time there away from my family for, for nothing? And a lot of us veterans feel that way. Um, so, yeah. but, but that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, you know, at, at least I'm getting the truth. I knew I'd get the truth from you today. And that's why I was happy to, talk to you because you always tell the truth and I know you're everywhere. I've known you for years. I know you're not bullshitting. You're sitting there shitting in holes just like the guys when you go out in the field. So, um, but yeah, I, this has been amazing. I, I, awesome. And I'm glad you're safe. And, and uh, yeah, I, I don't see you calming down for a little while. You still got a little while longer, but you got to get out of your city. I don't ever want to calm down. <laughs> yeah. I want to make it do like, I don't know, bake cookies or something. <laughs> I bet you'd make some damn good cookies being around everywhere. I can't year. cook. I tried to cook this morning and like I just forgot that I'd even had the oven on and then I burned something and I just gave up and uh, went across the range. All right, it's, you're not ready. I wish I could. You're not ready. You're not ready. <laughs> all right, you're not ready. Right. Well, I'm glad we're glad to have you on again. Holly, you're, you're awesome and, and you you're you're the real deal with media. They can learn from you. Thank yeah, you. you. Are. And thank you for all your support over the years and and for both of you for having me on again and it's always um it's always great fun to come and oh, come and, you, come and have a, a yarn about <laughs> God. The world. Yeah, you're you're you're, you're going. We'll make you a regular if you don't mind. Whenever you can't come. On. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll definitely do it again. Okay. And plus, I think I really do see in the next couple of months us going a video because I'll I'll finally be in my own space in Connecticut. Um, I'm gonna get everything set up to make it happen. We have friends of the show who know how to do video because I really. 
don't know how to edit video, so we'll we'll, we'll make it happen. Well, and you better be ready when you're we'll when you're on for video. You're gonna yeah. get a lot of offers for guys to marry you. I'm, they're gonna see what you look like, and they'll be That's like, true. "Holy shit, she's not married!" And so just yeah. be like, "She's got that voice." <laughs> and, and she looks like. I don't know if anyone can put up with me at this point. <laughs> but, but she can't cook. But two out of three is not. Oh, is that is that? Am I being am I being chauvinistic by saying that in today's American society? Oh shit! <laughs> Cancel right. Battle Line podcast yeah, now. Uh, no. But also, so, um, I'll add as well. So, my photographer Jake and I have a photo book, a coffee table book oh, um, nice. called Afghanistan that's going to be coming out around April. So, you can pre order that. Awesome. Um, that's awesome. The, yeah, D'Angelo Publications website. And it's really beautiful. Jake um, took just incredible photographs of, you know, Afghanistan during the fall and then after. Wow. And so, this is sort of a chance for people to. And I did the writing for it, but it's a chance for people to kind of see the, the Afghanistan now and, and what this sort of new era uh, with the Taliban leadership is like. And it's a, it's some really, yeah, it's a, it was, um, I just, yeah, please buy it because I just think it's a, you know, his photographs are amazing and it's a, just an insight, I think, especially for a lot of the U.S. military who spent the time there to kind of see what, um, what, it, how it's transpired now. And, it, and, and Afghanistan so, yeah, is great. awesome. I, it's just savagely beautiful. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all for wanting to stay oh, there. Goodness. I love Afghanistan. I love it. It's literally just, I always say to people, you know, I've been to everywhere in the world, but nothing grabbed my heart like yeah, Afghanistan. I'm, I'm with you. It's just such a beautiful beautiful country where every province you go to is completely unique and different and and just you know and again it's it's just people would give me all sorts of hate because i was always trying to highlight the beauty of afghanistan and i'd take a picture of you know the bamiyan and and the the lakes yep. and and Pangea valley or whatever it is and people are always hating on me saying oh my gosh there's a genocide da, 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 what are you doing um because you can just never please people but i just think you get <laughs> We can only look at, we always look at Afghanistan as being a war. And of course it has been for a very, very long time, even before the US, but it's such an incredibly beautiful place. And I just never want that aspect of it to be lost. That's, that's well said. Yeah, no, I think it just doesn't fit people's narratives. Like the narrative is yeah. the entire Middle East, uh, besides Israel, these are all shithole countries. They're, and, and yeah, and knowing from you guys who have actually been there, which I've only been to Israel in the Middle East, but yeah, that's not the case. So um, once again, pre-order the new book and then also check out Only Cry for the Living, which you could hear on Audible, battlelinepodcast.com slash audible. And you could use that 30 day trial and hear that, which you did the narration for. So check that out at Holly S. McKay on all social media um, and also subscribe on Substack and helpbcrf.org at helpbcrf for burnt children relief, which you take plenty of photos with these children who have been uh, badly burnt in, in war, wars that they have nothing to do with. So yeah. amazing Syrian yeah. kids. Thank, thanks Holly again. It's good to see you again. I'm glad you're safe and, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to stay in touch and we're definitely getting you back on the show again. Awesome. And see you guys for cigars in DC. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. You're, uh, DC though, can we go maybe Virginia Beach? <laughs> well, Virginia, Virginia, yeah. not Let's in DC. Let's go to Virginia Beach or something. I mean, Virginia. Okay, sounds good. That'll work. All right. Yeah, I'll drive there. But yeah, thanks again, guys. As always, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And um, if you have any questions in a couple of weeks, we're going to do another Q&A episode. So Podcast at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, that's it. Have a great week, guys. See you guys. Thank you. <laughs> That's all for this episode of the Battle Line Podcast. But we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk. Until then, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Battle Line Podcast and on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. To sign up for future Battle Line tactical courses, go to www.christantoperanto.net. Believe in yourself, face all challenges head on, and as always, never, never quit. quit.